Welcome to Soul Brew Liberation Sessions. I'm Luth, producer and host of Soul Brew with Beth Seda Congregation. This Passover podcast series hopes to stir your minds and souls as we explore liberation. On this holiday, we draw from our ancient story of freedom to inspire us in our ongoing stories of liberation today. These journeys are personal and collective. As we work to free ourselves from what confines us, and build a freer future for all. In a series of episodes, we'll hear conversations with different people, folks from Toronto to Harlem to Pakistan, a Jewish thinker, a queer Jewish musician, and justice activists to hear their liberation work, their stories, and their wisdom. Together, we'll gain insights into the pain and joys, the grief and celebration, the exile and bliss of existence, of emergence, and of becoming. Welcome back to Soul Brew. On today's Soul Brew Liberation Sessions, We're going to explore bringing Jewish notions of liberation into our everyday lives. Joining us is Dr. Elliot Malamit. Elliot is a renowned contemporary thinker, originally from Toronto. He's now based in Jerusalem, where he teaches literature at Hebrew U and Jewish thought at a bunch of different Israeli institutions. To hear more of his teachings, check out livingjewishly.org, where you'll find his insightful blogging on Jewish ethics and his new podcast series on Judaism and mental health. Welcome, Elliot. It's a it's a pleasure to to reconnect and to have you join us on today's podcast. How are you today? Doing great. Looking forward. So we'll jump right in. You know, we're celebrating our holiday of liberation, where we're asked to experience freedom for ourselves in each generation. And depending on the time period and location in Jewish history, this experience has sometimes been more literal, if it's been a period of Jewish history with a lot of oppression. Um, and sometimes been more spiritual or personal. And many contemporary Westerners, fortunately, haven't experienced literal bondage, um, although there is plenty of slavery around the world today. But everyone has their own personal Mitzrayim, you know, Mitzrayim from the word, from the narrows, this place where they're hemmed in and stuck in their lives. How do we achieve liberation from these states of anxiety and dissatisfaction that seem to haunt many of us today, um, even if we live in relatively relatively well-off circumstances? What are some of the forces that conspire to keep us enslaved? And how might we begin to live the lives that we really want want to be living and to feel the sense of liberation in our personal lives? Thank you, Bluth. Those are really good questions. And the first thing is to be aware of the forces that are operating on us. So I, I think that part of what happens when you go through a, a Haggadah Seder experience is that if you are too focused, ironically, if you're too focused on the Egypt part of ancient Egypt, it can seem sort of alienating. It can be fun, but not that meaningful because people aren't coming out of Egypt. There are still approximately 40 million people in some form of slavery around the world. So it's not a a small matter. But the truth is that most people, most Jews who sit down, especially in the Western world, to their satyrs are probably not experiencing physical slavery. So it becomes, as you suggest, something that's operating more on the metaphorical level. But the kinds of things that we feel hem us in and make us feel stuck. And I think here the key word is actually one that you find literally in the Hebrew term for Egypt, which is Mitzrayim. And in Hebrew, those two letters, Tzadi Resh, the Tsar part of the word, mean narrow or constricted or to be in straits. We even have prayers that use that language. There's a very famous Psalm 118 
that says min hametsar, same word as Egypt, min hametsar karatiya, from a narrow place I call to you God. So I think that what we're trying to do on Passover is to think about our own situations where we feel narrowed in a sense. And I think the whole evening, in a way, is really the dilemma of a narrow life um, where you find yourself constricted for one reason or another. And so your task of leaving your personal Mitzrayim is how do you escape your narrowness? Where does that constriction come from? Why do we find our lives so hemmed in? What it is that we can do to address the problem of narrowness? Well, I think to begin with, we have to examine the sorts of things that are operating in our life, especially today. I would really locate a few essential factors. What's our relationship to time? What's our relationship to meaning? Um, what's our relationship to distraction? And are we living the lives we want to? Or are we simply feeling that we're constantly being persuaded by forces from outside? So let's begin with time. It's very, very strange thing to say that we're all going to die. And yet it is, and people sort of try and slough that off because it sounds depressing. But all Jewish holidays essentially tell you that there's moments in time that are really important and they don't come again. And they're what we call sacred moments. And if we go through them in a kind of by rote fashion, we're going to look up in a lot of years have passed and we haven't made use of the time properly. So Passover is definitely something that gets you to think about your life, whether you feel like you're living the life you want to. And if you are not, how did you get there? So that I would say is the first thing, just to think about how we spend our time. But probably even more importantly is slavery as kind of meaninglessness and distraction. And here I would point out again that the language in the Haggadah can be an excellent guide if we think about it more existentially. So an example of this would be, everybody's going to come across a phrase that the Egyptians made B'nai Israel serve B'farech. And when you have Hebrew words, especially in older Haggadot, they have these really kind of awkward King's English kind of translations that don't really mean that much to people. So if you look in a classic Haggadah and you look at the word farech, it'll say something like served with rigor. And, and that's not something that <clears throat> really excites people. The real meaning of the word, and I think it's something that everybody can relate to, is whether the stuff that I do, where I really kill myself every day, brings me meaning or if it's just futile. There's a lovely image from Chacham Yosef, known as the Ben Ishchai, who was a great scholar in 19th century Baghdad. And he said, Befarach means doing meaningless work, such as, and the example he gives is quite striking, you take water from a river, and then you just pour it right back. So in other words, you, it's just a circular loop. You're really not progressing anywhere. So I think that Along with thinking about how we spend our time, we also want to be doing things that are meaningful. Mm. Thanks for that. I love that. So the invitation is to sort of begin with awareness and bringing awareness to these places of tsar, of narrowness, of constriction in our lives. And being a scribe, I can't help but think of the word tsar, you know, the tsadi and the reish. The tsadi, if you, if you look at the little letter of a tsadi, it actually... It, it looks like a little um, a little person with their hands up in the air. And the resh is like a person bent over. And I feel like both of these letters, you know, the hands up in the air in some level, I think, is like in praise, you know, in devotion, in reaching out in celebration. But it's also maybe in this sort of like panic, giving up, like help. You know, there's a desperation to that letter. Um, and I think the race, you know, this curved over letter that 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 word itself really does have that kind of panic of narrowness. That's very cool. <laughs> My doodle brain is always, you know, thinking, what what does the word look like? And and I love that. So bringing awareness into these aspects of our lives, particularly around like, what are we doing with our time? And and is it meaningful? Are we living these lives that we want to be living? Um, and the Haggadah as this guide for these existential kind of questions for us. I said before that there's a relationship between what we do on Pesach and the fact that we're going to die. And I think that's not an obvious connection. So I want to make it a little bit more obvious. Many of us spend a lot of time in the modern world doing something 
that you wouldn't ordinarily associate with our days, but I think it's actually a core thing that we do, and that's that we distract ourselves. We distract ourselves through so many different kinds of things. And when you talk about distraction, you always have to ask the question, what are you distracting yourself from? And the odd, almost bizarre answer is we're actually distracting ourselves from facing the fact that we're alive and we're alive for a certain amount of time and that that time is finite. And because we don't really want to think about that and what comes with that, so oddly, we spend a great deal of our time living as distraction. In that sense, I think that's always been a problem. It's not just a modern problem. People are talking about this centuries ago. Blaise Pascal said one of the great problems of life is just being able to sit quietly in a room. And Nietzsche in the late 19th century is also talking a lot about the fact that people are distracting themselves. So what makes contemporary life different? Well, I think it's obviously the combination of technology and capitalism so that you have forces at work that are really impinging on our ability to feel a deep sense of agency. There, there's a wonderful book by the American thinker Matthew Crawford, and it's called The World Beyond Your Head. And one of the things that Crawford talks about in that book is this sort of barrage of things that are there to distract us. And the distraction that occurs in modernity is that we're distracted towards something and away from something. The thing that we're distracted away from is actually communicating with one another. Actual human response, one-to-one. -one. And what we're distracted towards is something being sold to us. And I still remember in the introduction of the book, he has such a funny, poignant example, which is that in Seoul, South Korea, when you are the, on the bus, as the bus is about to stop near the Dunkin' Donuts store, there's actually a scent that's released in the bus that resembles sort of Dunkin' Donuts coffee. And it, it's sent into the ventilation system of the bus as, by the way, it's a double whammy, as a Dunkin' Donuts advertisement plays over the bus sound system just before the bus stop for the Dunkin' Donuts store. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so... What he talks about there is that there's no space left to be a person anymore, right? That that technology and corporate um, interests have penetrated everywhere, including the public space. It's almost like there feels like there's no place to get away from it. So that's one piece of it. The other piece of it, I think, is all of our platforms, whether it's just, you know, email or texting or WhatsApp or Instagram or Facebook or all sorts of social media where there's a new kind of expectation of human beings. And that expectation is you will have to respond to me instantly. So if I send you a message and you haven't responded in a minute or two, I'll send you a follow-up message, a little bit indignant. <laughs> why, why didn't you answer me? So there's this increasing sense that my space is not my own, my time is not my own, my life is not my own. And the phrase that Crawford uses that I, I it, it resonated with me so powerfully when I first read it that it's stuck in my brain ever since, is that the valuable thing that we take for granted is the condition of not being addressed, not being addressed, right? That you have a human right to not have to respond to not have to be constantly engaged. So look at the irony of what I've just said in the last few minutes. On the one hand, we don't engage enough. And on the other hand, we engage too much. <laughs> so how did that happen? Part of our slavery is that our, the real engagement, which is people genuinely interacting, free of commercials and free of distractions and free of somebody you know, just sort of utilizing you for their purposes, but two individuals really interfacing, that's really declining. But on the other hand, being engaged by other people on this kind of surface, chatty, chirpy, constant basis, it's just exponentially multiplying, right? It's really hard at the end of those cycles to feel a real sense of agency, autonomy, freedom. Those big words we use, like freedom and liberation, they're grounded, right, in certain conditions. 
the condition of agency, which means that I choose mindfully, deliberately what I want to do with whom I want to do it. Space. I can carve out some kind of psychic space for myself to think, to reflect, right? Because thinking is slow. Thinking takes time, it takes effort, it takes energy, it takes privacy. All of these things are conditions for internal freedom where I'm not constantly rising to somebody else's seduction or somebody else's sale or somebody else's claim on my time. So if we can't curate those conditions for ourselves, it's gonna get increasingly difficult to feel free. So I want to ask you, you know, how does being freed from our personal Mitzrayims, this, as you just described it, sort of stepping into agency, into presence, into intentionality in our lives, um, influence how, how does that influence how we show up in the world to those who are truly enslaved? You know, you gave us that staggering statistic that 40 million people are enslaved around the world today. And this, I imagine, is, you know, forced marriage, human trafficking, um, bondage, indentured servitude. Um, and in, yeah, and in some places, while there might not even be slavery still, the legacy of those systems still exist in covert ways. And, you know, we're seeing that with um, the U.S. today and the social movements that have sort of emerged with a lot of power this year. So I want to ask you, what, what does our story of Exodus mean to us as Jews and how we position ourselves in the greater global community as we do this work of leaving our personal Egypts and gaining more agency and liberation in our own personal lives? Um, is that it? Or is there a collective liberation component to what we're being invited into as Jews here? No, that's a very good question, and it's difficult because many of us don't feel a lot of power or ability to influence events that seem so much bigger than us. And uh, if you sort of wed that with a certain kind of skepticism about politics and whether ordinary people are able to affect the political processes, so there is a sense that people have of deflation, I think, in terms of trying to you know, right larger wrongs. I think there's also an irony, a deep irony for Jews, because sometimes we, we don't actually realize just how powerful our own tradition has been globally. If you think about the Exodus from Egypt, it's not just a historical memory for Jews at this point. It's a, a cultural trope of, of the greatest magnitude, right? You have everything from, you know, freedom, you know, from liberation theology people in Latin and South America to obviously the civil rights movement of the 60s and the kind of symbology that you have in the Bible, the promised land, um, you know, free at last and so on is something that is now universal. In terms of what we actually can do with it beyond our sort of private quest for more agency, I think the next best thing to being there, since I'm not suggesting everybody go into slavery just so they can appreciate the, the magnitude of the problem, but the best next thing I think would be to educate ourselves about a kind of ongoing disgrace that takes place around the world in terms of slavery and slavery in our midst, you know, wherever you live. Um, I live in Israel, you know, many of our listeners live in Canada, the United States, and all of those countries have slavery problems, have sexual trafficking, have people forced to live lives they don't want to. So just knowing about it, uh, knowing about injustices that have to do with being a minority in any sense of the word, that I think contributes to the solution. When you think about how political consensus is built and how what we call public opinion is built, it's built day by day, step by step, conversation by conversation. And if you think of the conversations that have taken place um, especially in America in the last four years, which are kind of toxic conversations because they're not built on uh, mutual respect, mutual understanding, um, and often not built on facts. So you have a tremendous problem if you want people to eventually rise up and do something about what goes on in the world. The first thing we have to do is be aware, and to be aware, we have to listen, and we have to educate ourselves. So on a very, very micro level, I would say that our Seder tables would be a great place to start. 
to discuss and share information uh, about, first of all, real slavery, this global blight that we have, because it's kind of, frankly, jokey to sit there and go, oh, let's pretend we're slaves coming out of Egypt. Like, that's fun. Um, but it's not real. And it's not real for most people. But the slavery that's around you is very real. If, if uh, I've, I've sort of mentioned this to students, that if the Haggadah is a kind of a play and we're the actors and the actresses, then, you know, maybe we can learn the most about the human condition by acting it out. So if you go see Hamlet and you see the cost of procrastination for the title character, what he loses by delaying, that's probably more affecting than any number of parental lectures about, you know, you know, pick up your room, your garbage in your room. And I think that's true of what we can do at the Seder too, like let's really experience and talk about what it is that's going on and what we can do in even tiny, tiny ways to help. But it all starts with clarity and it starts with hearing what other people have to say. One last thing here, Bluth, is it also starts with engagement, right? There's, there's too much of a by rote performative at this point about the Seder, even if it's a fun performative. So people sort of sleep through half of it and then they do the fun bits, you know, they dip the, you know, the 10 drops of wine and they sing the songs and they, you know, eat the matzah and they do the, the things with the plagues and the jokey parts. And, and I do that too. And I have a good time, but um, we're missing a huge opportunity to how, how many times a year do groups get together, Jewish family groups, unless you're like really observant and have FaceTime with each other in which they have a meal that's organized around rituals. Like it's a real rarity. And so if we can match that to actual content, it would be a great thing. And I think that to really make it work for everybody, we have to ask questions at the table that are engaging to people that are somehow going beyond just the narrow bandwidth of any particular item in the Haggadah and talk to them about larger things and make the linkage to contemporary issues. You've taken us in a different, you sort of rooted us in the Seder to answer this question around like theory for change. And you know, how does, how are we positioned as Jews in this greater global community? You've discussed the scope of liberation, this sort of ongoing slow collective process um, and brought us down to beginning with education, with listening, with awareness, that that's the, that's the kernel of beginning for a theory for change. And where can we do that in our community and in our ritual? What, like what we have so distinctly and uniquely is the Seder, which is supposed to be an, ex, an experiential storytelling, engaging experience. Although it's become very rote and performative sometimes and maybe boring and random in one of those traditions that we just do because we do it, um, it is actually you know, an opportunity for us to not just look at um, the Exodus as something that we are commemorating historically, but it's like liberating the Seder itself so that it can truly be a meaningful experience that is joyous, that taps into tradition, a place for us for sort of spiritual, emotional, um, and political engagement uh, sort of fuel, fuel for that. Yeah, for sure. And actually, that's the, you know, Liberating the Seder is the title of classes I've been giving recently to talk about how we can get out of this kind of by situation. It, it's actually, in some ways, quite tragic that we have this weird dichotomy that the people who are really committed to Jewish life and, say, Jewish law, pay a lot of attention to the minutiae of the Seder and don't pay a lot of attention to say global university universal issues of you know injustice um, and people who are you know very conscious of injustice for you know people of color sexual orientation indigenous nations often aren't that involved Seder wise or the Seder just becomes a kind of thin excuse to just talk about these other matters. And what bothers me about that is that there's actually things in the Seder. I think ritual is a fantastic anchor to think about um, larger possibilities that we don't have to split apart what it means to be Jewish and what it means to do Jewish from 
thinking about questions of great import that affect every human being on earth. And it's that, it's that cleaving apart of those things that's actually one of the saddest things that's occurred in, in contemporary Judaism. And just even like a tiny, tiny example, which is um, a ritual we do every year near the beginning of the Haggadah, it's called Yachatz. And Yachatz comes from the Hebrew word Chetzi, which means half. And it's the, just the gesture of taking the middle matzah and breaking it in half and thinking clearly about what this gesture of breaking bread means. What does it mean to share with another human being? What is the price of sharing, right? There's this very poignant narrative in Primo Levi's memoir from Auschwitz called Survival in Auschwitz, in which he talks about the agonizing decision that the camp inmates had every day of what to do with their tiny little bread ration. Do they eat it all at once when they get it? If they eat it all at once, then they'll be hungry for the rest of the day. Or do they do yachatz? Do they split it in half, which is really taking a microscopic amount of bread and splitting it in half, so that psychologically they'll have this little kernel of bread for later on. But of course they could lose it, it could get stolen. That anxiety, says Levy, accompanied them every day. So yachatz is a sign of poverty because you can't even trust yourself to eat everything now because maybe there won't be anything left for you later or tomorrow. It's obviously a sign of great wealth because you have the ability, the agency to share. And sharing means that you're engaged in a relationship with another human being, like to be is to be with. So just the tiny symbology of that little ritual and of course, that's a universal ritual, the notion of breaking bread, but thinking more deeply about it and thinking what it could mean in our world is, I think, a good example of how you can tie in ritual to meaning. The sort of dance between the particular and the universal, you know, how we can bring those together through ritual and land in the particular details of it and let that be a launching place for us to engage with the universal. Um, and, and as you said yourself, we sort of see that in the trope of, of um, the Exodus, that it has, it has gone beyond just Jewishness and, and Judaism. You know, it is something that has extended universally. And so inherent in this project of liberation is our personal story as a nation. And yet we see throughout the Torah that the, our personal experience with liberation has become the sort of impetus for our moral and ethical codes at large, right? It's like, do not oppress the stranger because you were once oppressed in Egypt. Like we have, there is a sort of interplay of the specific and the universal all the time. Um, and I love bringing that in. I love that bringing that into the ritual um, itself and not, not falling into the trap of either diluting our ritual for universal humanistic values. And at the same time, not being so obsessed with the ritual minute details that we forget that this is supposed to be about life itself. Thinking of the Seder and how the Seder tries within its own arc and its own st structure to sort of bring us through a process, it invites us in. And of course, I, I, as, as most people listening will know, one of the central parts of the Seder is this asking of questions. You know, the, the Seder kind of gives us this tool saying like, how can we take the ritual and expand beyond it? We're going to engage the children in this experiential education vibe of question asking. You know, and what's funny is that we ask you know, why is this night different from all other nights? But once you've asked that question so many times, it, it's like, you know, it, it, the question like loses its, the, the night doesn't feel different from all other nights. The night feels like the same Passover that we did last year and last year and last year. <laughs> like we might have to do a little updating of our, of our questions, but I wanted to talk to you a little bit about children, especially how the Haggadah views the section of the four children or the four sons in traditional in, in the traditional language. You shared with me that there's approximately four to five thousand illustrated Haggadahs in existence, and the illustrations always reflect these specific cultural and historical outlooks, depending where and when they are published. So society has sort of influenced how their specific Haggadahs look 
and feel. And it's fascinating that that is actually something that emerges in the artist, you know, in, in the drawings and in the, in the artistry of, of the four children. Why is it that the rabbis recreate the picture of the children mentioned in the Torah? And why did they attach particular designations to these children that don't exist in the Bible? And like, what are the implications of us? In a way, it seems like they're, they're trying to, in all of our societies, we're trying to make these pictures fit with, you know, who are the, the four children today? What are the different types of personalities today? Do these four children help us? You know, are these, is this a educational tool? Are they imprisoning us with more labels and more categories? And how our sort of modern education and child development understanding has, has played into the Haggadah here? I mean, I don't think that any respectable educator or child development expert at this point would ever have come up with these four uh, sons or four daughters ever, because the notion that any child is just one of these things is absurd, just like it's absurd to say that an adult doesn't have parts in them that are wise and parts of them that are, you know, that are baser or simplistic or inarticulate or ashamed which is what all of these states suggest. So what's interesting to me in the four sons and the attitude to children in general is a the artistic depictions. And when you go through some of the illustrated Haggadot, it's really a fascinating Rorschach of what different cultures consider to be wise children and wicked children. So generally there was a bias in Jewish history against physicality. So often the wicked sons in the illustrated Haggadot are specimens. They're soldiers, they're boxers, they're brawny, they're muscular, and inevitably the wise son, who bizarrely is often looks like he's about 55 years old in the, um, you know, in the plates, <laughs> the artistic plates, is, you know, fully um, suited with a hat and, and tie and glasses and, you know, leaning over a, a book and looking very studious and scholarly. And that obviously reflects the Jewish tradition's privileging of intellectual pursuit and its suspicion of physical pursuit, probably because we were powerless. And so paradigms like soldiers and military people often represented oppressors and, and bad people. So this sort of Rorschach continues on into the into the 20th century. It is noteworthy that early Zionist Haggadahs, which are kind of more socialist and bent, will show the wise child as actually the brawny outdoors type um, and the wicked child is kind of looking more capitalist. So that too is a kind of flip of, of the general paradigm. Why do the rabbis come up with this label? I mean, I, I don't have a, a great answer for you there. I assume that there was an, there may have been um, fear about defection from the religion or heresy, um, possibly people crossing over into either paganism or Christianity, but there was a need to single out a child and label that child defined as if you're like this kid, it's bad news. There's several problems with this. The first problem, strangely, is that the Bible itself has no labels for these children. It doesn't call one child wise or one child wicked or one child simple. It just says very simply, if your child comes and asks you X question, you might want to give them Y answer. And that's all it does. It's the rabbis who sort of relabel these things. These four children, are they they're mentioned in the Torah in relation to Exodus? Yes. I mean, in a certain sense, there's four times throughout the, in Exodus, but also in the book of Deuteronomy, that the text talks about a child either asking a question about the Exodus or in the case of what later becomes labeled the wicked child saying something, you know, um, if your child will say to you. Um, but yes, there's four instances where this occurs. So what the rabbis do is they sort of pounce on these four instances, extract the kids involved in these instances, and give them labels. It seems extremely unlikely to me that the original context of the Bible, there were labels for these kids, and there's a much more positive attitude. It's really just they're asking a question, we'll give you an answer. So it was used for ideological purposes. The, the problem is that I don't believe that anybody I know that I respect in education would ever do to, say, the wicked child, 
um, what it is that the Haggadah is suggesting that you do to the wicked child, which is basically to shut the kid up, in the words of the Haggadah, to sort of blunt or smack his teeth, and to mock him, to say, well, you know what, if you'd been in Egypt, you wouldn't have been redeemed, and you're not like us. That'd be horrifying. So, I mean, it's interesting that in contemporary Haggadot, there's an attempt to sort of reframe it often, and there are much softer versions of it, where the wicked child's not seen as evil, you know, he's seen as like sort of spirited or, you know, rebellious, but, you know, trying to raise important questions and so on. And there's a sort of growing understanding that you can't, you can't label children in this way. And I would say that the other thing that takes place is, well, who are the parents of these children, right? They almost seem parentless um, in the rabbinic understanding. It's like the parents are just responding to them as opposed to having raised them. So in contemporary Haggadot, you do get more discussion of the sort of reciprocal interaction between the kid and the child. I guess one good example for that would be the late Rabbi Jonathan Sachs and his chief rabbi's Haggadah has a whole long riff on the wicked child. And the wicked child's basically saying, because the wicked child's question is, what is this service to you? Ma'avodazot lachem which in the rabbinic imagination was taken as like a really mocking, sarcastic challenge. But in Rabbi Sachs's reformulation, it's really a very sincere question. Like, I don't know what Judaism means to you because you're constantly sending me mixed messages about what Judaism means to you. Like, you sort of want me to marry somebody Jewish, but you're not that interested in doing Jewish. And like, I don't get it. So the wicked child in this framing is more of a confused kid. And the confusion was caused by the sort of inconsistent signaling that the parents sent. That is actually a pretty typical reframing of the kid in the modern context. It's not surprising, really, because the way we think about children, about child development, is so much different now. We don't we don't think of it as like, you know, exclusive labeling, like people are only one thing. It just doesn't speak to our experience. By the way, so this would be another interesting thing to talk about at the table, which is to talk about like, you know, what, what do you think makes a wise kid? What do you think? The kid who really interests me is the one who can't, doesn't know how to ask a question. I'm really curious about that child. Because when you see silent children, you have to ask yourself, are they silent because they're ignorant? Are they silent perhaps because they're ashamed? They've been made to feel like they shouldn't be saying anything. Are they silent because they're watchful? They're the listening kind of child that doesn't miss anything doesn't say anything, but doesn't miss anything, right? There's a lot hidden underneath these labels. Yeah, it's interesting, and it does feel like an activity unto itself. You know, what would it look like for us to rewrite this section of the Haggadah? You know, like, what is, what is, this, section, uh, what is this section of the Haggadah even doing? Is it asking us... What are the different ways to different people with different learning styles? How are we going to tell the story? So, you know, on one hand, we tell the story and on the other hand, they, they understand it. You know, there's a lot of, there's a big question of communication here. It's like how this is coming in a section where we're supposed to tell the whole story of Exodus and we're being told that people are different. You know, people have different values, people have different styles, and how is it that we're gonna share the story so that we can all truly feel this experiential journey of liberation ourselves? I don't know if this is a, a little um, chutzvahdik to say, but I often think of when, <laughs> when looking at the Haggadah, like which are the sections that I would skip over? Um, I love the arc of it. I love the journey that it brings us through. You know, the rabbis say like the the Haggadah, the, the sort of most core structure for the Haggadah is to bring us from um, gnut to shevach, from indignity to praise. And then over the years, there's been this very specific set of stages that have been built into the Haggadah. And yet, you know, and Seder means order. You know, the order of the Haggadah is very important. We sing Kadesh, Urchatz, you know, there, there's something so important there. And yet at the same time, like Passover, you know, it's like from the idea to pass over something, to, to skip something. So I always ask this question to myself of like, here, we are given a very strict order 
but the holiday is about jumping over things. So what is, you know, what parts are we going to leave out this year and what parts are we going to dive into this year? And I have to say that there's something about the section of the four children that, yeah, I think I'm going to have to sit, you know, I, I have to sit with that for the years to come. Like what, what, what is it really trying to do? Can we re-enchant it? It's interesting to me that it is rooted in the Bible. I didn't realize that it had such sort of Torah origins to it, which does feel important. Anyways, <laughs> food for thought for our listeners to our satyrs to come of like which which sections speak to us and which don't. And do we feel free to skip some? Um, you know, the the sages are even always telling us like which sections are the most important. You know, Pesach, Matzah, Maror. So there is a little wiggle room, but... Anyways, I'd be curious to hear what, what are the sections that people uh, <laughs> that people jump over. Well, it's interesting when you talk about that last section, Pesach Matzah Maror, it's, it, that's Rabban Gamliel. And when he talks about it, you almost feel like he's like wrenching everybody back to reality because the parts before that, there's a sort of long segue onto rabbinic interpretations of words and kind of fantastical notions and for my money really boring stuff um, for a long stretch there this is the confessional part of this podcast <laughs> oh no i i think the dirty little secret is the haggadah is actually a very in some ways quite a dysfunctional text i think the rituals in the haggadah work really well i think the narrative is uh, slightly insane because if you really want to tell the story of the exodus so tell it take the parts from the book of exodus and read them and they're really quite compelling reading. It's not a text about the Exodus. It's a text about the rabbinic mind for like a long stretch of time. And when Rabbi Gamliel says Pesach Matzah he's almost saying to the reader and sort of just to the whole aura of the thing, let's get back to basics. What's this evening about? It's about the Paschal Lamb, which was the symbol that the Jews were breaking from paganism and embracing monotheism. It's about matzah, which is the bread of freedom or the bread of poverty, depending on how you want to understand it. And it's about bitterness. It's about the maror, the harshness of experience and how we all go through really difficult times in our lives and whether we're able to construct a new, better, freer, happier life. And those are the rudiments of what we're doing here, because there is a kind of haze <laughs> that can take place for almost an hour <laughs> um, in the middle of that narrative. I, I don't actually think that it's a bad thing to skip, but I think a more interesting thing would be to not skip and reframe. You know, think about language, think about story, and think about how we can make these things real to ourselves. Right. It's great. And it's so important to feel that permission to to reframe. You know, that is what it's all about. And just to just to jump on the Pesach Matzah Maror that you just spoke about, I, as you were saying it, I was struck by how each of these things have built into it the paradox of freedom and unfreedom, or grief and joy. The Matzah, you said yourself, it's like the bread of poverty or the bread of freedom. We have the the harshness of the Maror and the the Paschal Lamb. You know, the which which now. At our seder's now we eat as afikomen, but back in the day was this the was this incredible offering and a huge feast and a communal eating, um, a sort of democratized offering that symbolizes our freedom. These three things together are so sort of interwoven with each other that that our liberation really emerges from the pain. And I also like how you know these three things really bring us back to temple times in some ways, which is just. I feel like an important thing to remember that that is the roots of our rabbinic tradition sort of grew out of a temple worship. And back in the day on, you know, the Seder was was conducted. It was a pilgrimage holiday, you know, to the temple, to Jerusalem. This was one of the only offerings, if not the only offering that was offered by each person or each family each grouping of people, it wasn't just the Kohens, the, the, the priests. And they would give the Paschal lamb offering, sort of Lezecher Yitziat Mitzrayim, in, in remembrance of being freed from Egypt. And then, and then these families would eat the roasted lamb in bands. You know, this is all who are hungry, come eat. There was like a real communal feast. 
um, and it all had to be eaten. You know, it was eaten by by midnight, and and the the Levites were playing Hallel. This there, there was so much celebration here. Um, it was truly like a cel- celebratory feast. And sometimes, if I look at, it, it, I don't know, maybe it's just a, a, a maybe I'm only saying it now as a reminder to bring that joyousness and that collectiveness into our holiday experience into our Passover experience. We recite Halal every day because this is truly a time of celebration, a celebration that emerged from the Marar, you know, from the bread of poverty. Like we we, we do the Yachatz, there's a breaking that happens that then emerges us into freedom. And I'll just say once more that the sages taught us that the, the basic structure of the Haggadah is to go from indignity to praise. The beginning of the Haggadah is so specific, but it does end in Halal. You know, it brings us to a place of song. Right. I think they had it right, actually, in the temple for a couple of reasons. One is the communal nature of what they were doing. I mean, unless you're a vegan, which would make it harder. But, you know, eating this lamb and eating it possibly with other families. But the part that's most striking to me is that they ate first and talked later. <laughs> um, you know, that that continuous complaint that people have, you know, when are we going to get to the meal? When are we going to eat? They didn't have that problem because they ate. We don't have this sort of rigidity. We we feed our stomachs first and then with uh, under the influence of uh, the four cups of wine and having already satisfied um, our hunger, we're now going to discuss matters of great import. And I think that's a really cool model. Um, we have a very squirmy, squeamish model where everybody's kind of sitting in their seats and kind of hungry and half the table's waiting to get to the meal. And it's quite anxiety provoking, actually. Um, they had a much more chill, celebratory vibe to the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's really fascinating. You know, it's it's interesting to to pause for a second and just to look at how we recreated our religion you know what did the rabbinic tradition become and how did we try to hold on to things of past and um yeah i'd also love to go to that feast to be honest (laughs) um it was so wonderful to to learn from you and to hear your thoughts my final question as i ask everyone is if you would just like to take a moment to um, leave our listeners with a blessing with well wishes for this holiday for this passover holiday Look, I think this Passover and last Passover are very unusual moments in our time um, and certainly the time of our century. What it means to be celebrating Pesach in in the midst of a pandemic, which hopefully we're now emerging from uh, little by little. I think it's a time when you talk about one of the key words in Judaism, which is to remember what we're doing on this night is we're remembering the exodus from Egypt. So there's an exodus underway now um, from um, illness and isolation and sadness to hopefully recommuning and re-engaging. So I think there's two things that we can think about this Pesach. One is um, loss, the people who have, who have died, who've gotten sick and been permanently affected and the the toll that it has taken on everybody and just giving that its due but also i think a very very significant reboot in our time and i don't know that anyone alive today perhaps since the second world war has had that uh has there's been a kind of global sense of rebooting of what comes next of what comes after I think that's true on a global scale, and I think it's true on an individual scale. My blessing to everybody would be that you can come out of this and really rethink your life and free yourself from things that seem unimportant, time-wasting, insignificant, and petty that have just robbed you of your time. Because now you, we really realize that time is precious, that things may not be the same year to year. Nobody would have thought last February what's occurred in the last 13 months. And it's a, really a signal lesson that we need to live. We need to live well, and we need to live the lives we want to live because time doesn't wait for anyone. And so my blessing to all of our listeners is that they should feel the freedom that comes with regaining a sense of the lives that we actually want to carry out and the love that we want to give to one another. Amen, amen. May it be so. And thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Chag Sameach.
Today's episode was produced by me and edited and co-produced by Ariana Skybell. The beautiful original music Min Hametsar is by Aviva Chernik. Special thanks also to Beth Zedek for hosting Soul Brew Liberation Sessions and giving us a platform for these meaningful conversations. Chag Sameach!